Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Lawrence Lynn, Director of External Relations and Outreach for the UCSF Stanford Center of Excellence in Regulatory Science and Innovation, or CIRCE for short. Uh, our CIRCE is a regulatory science center funded by the FDA with the goal of advancing regulatory science through collaborative research, education, and outreach activities, such as the lecture you're about to hear today. I encourage you to learn more about UCSF Stanford CIRCE on our website, which is ucsfstanfordcirce.org, and it's also in the uh, bottom right corner of the screen. Before we start with today's presentation, I just wanted to mention our upcoming Innovations in Regulatory Science Summit, which is scheduled for Sunday, January 10th, 2021. The summit will focus on oncology and the pandemic and feature leaders from academia, industry, and the FDA. Of particular note, we'll have keynote addresses from the directors of all three medical product review centers at the FDA, Peter Marks, Jeff Shuren, and Janet Woodcock. You can find the full agenda and speaker listing at the website shown on the screen, and this year the event will be virtual and free, so we hope you'll join us. It's now my pleasure to introduce Bakul Patel, Director of the Digital Health Center of Excellence at the Center for Devices and Radiological Health of the FDA. Mr. Patel is responsible for providing leadership and setting strategic direction and regulatory policy for digital health and emerging technologies at the agency. He received a master's degree from the University of Regina in Canada and an MBA from Johns Hopkins University. Prior to joining the FDA, Mr. Patel held leadership positions in the telecommunications, semiconductor, and information technology industries. Mr. Patel is currently leading the effort for the agency to develop a pragmatic regulatory approach for digital health that aims for patients and providers to have timely access to safe and effective digital health products. But cool, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Lawrence, and uh, welcome everybody. And thank you for having me today. I'm going to take a few minutes to walk through a short presentation and hopefully we can open up a dialogue and set the stage right in terms of you know, advancing regulatory science. So the first few slides are mostly about what, what I'm going to talk about, but let, this is probably where we want we're going to see where the world is heading in the world of digital health. And you can see the, guy, the future of medicine is going to be very different, especially you know, powered and fueled by the urgency and the need from the COVID situation we are in. But when you think, when I think about digital health, I think mainly in this way, where the convergence of connectivity, data, and computing power coming together at various walks of life in the healthcare ecosystem or the healthcare journey for an individual, and how it sort of moves the, the care that we all think about in typically in a clinic to the patient itself and patient centeredness is something that we think about. But as, as that happens, we also know that we are, we are in this world where we will be looking at new things or we'll be learning new things about patients in the wild, so to speak, and ultimately towards um, you know, focusing on prevention. And that's where most of the work in digital health is happening. As, as you can see, um, the advantages of, of some of this technology innovation is mostly in this in this place where you know care can become less costly, less invasive, and potentially predictive. And then before it before a disease or a symptom sort of shows up, and we all know that's almost too late when a certain acute situation shows up as a symptom. Uh, we wish we had caught it before. And I think the potential for digital health powered by software and AI can probably get us there. Is really the sort of the the light that we're looking for to see how we can, we can move forward. But it doesn't come um, free. And I think we need to work towards it. So FTA, you know, as we stood up the Center of Excellence in the, in the last month, uh, we've been focusing on this five things that we, they're clearly in, in FDA's sort of uh, view. One, it could be a medical product, a technology that is a medical product, a technology that is used inside a medical product. And then you, you think about how does it, if technology get manufactured or things that get manufacturing, the manufacturing aspects that could be predictive in nature from for a medical product. And then of course the clinical trials world and, and things that are now emerging as a you know, companion or adjunct to current therapies 
not necessarily medical product therapies, but also something that we, we, we look at uh, in terms of how care is provided. So when you, when you start thinking about this, it raises a whole bunch of questions. We, we all talk about consumers getting information, but then what do we do with that information? What does that call, how does it qualify? So you can see this, this questions with the sensors that surround a person raises, raises two part question is one is what should FTA provide expectations on and what, where should FTA sort of do work on um, to make sure that the regulatory pathways are actually in line with, with, the, with the mission of and the vision of getting people access to this technology in a timely fashion. So with that, with that goal in mind, we, we set off um, to establish the center of excellence and with, with the concept about it's a shared sort of goal for all involved in this, in this space where FTA is, is a player in, in the ecosystem, but also uh, a good contributor in, in a driving the right and responsible innovation that can happen in this space How, to meet the standards that we already know in terms of safety and effectiveness. Now, the, the center is geared towards a couple of things. One is connecting the work that's being done in areas, not just at FTA, but also outside of FTA and other, other parts of the ecosystem. Um, and then, you know, how do you bring that knowledge together so it becomes truly a network that, that people can all stand upon? And so that there's less duplication, maybe drive synergy, but at the end, we still want to innovate how we approach an SAV, how does FTA approach this technology when it's, when it's holding that standard of safety and effectiveness? And I think in totality, those three things will drive and empower all stakeholders uh, towards a place where we can truly look at driving innovation. So having, um, having said that, let me just share a little bit about areas of work, the center of excellence things that it will, will start focusing on. We already know we are focusing on software as a medical device. We already know we are working on artificial intelligence and policies and approaches related to that. And as you start thinking about other things like advanced manufacturing for a matter, for example, or advancing clinical trials, what would that start to look like? Um, digital pathology is another emerging area. Um, and you start looking at that and you take patient generated data and you merge that with clinical trials. How, how should that be used? How should that be sort of considered? What expectations we would have? What kind of evidence we would want to generate? I think you can see a lot of questions being risen from there. And we've been working on those areas and they all connect to each other. And then you, you start thinking about what does real world evidence and advanced clinical studies start to shape up? Should we start thinking about a glide path? Should we start thinking about a, a naturally growing evidence sort of base, how should we start thinking about that? So I'm, I'm raising these questions on purpose because I think as we start thinking about how do you advance regulatory science, we want to make sure that, you know, we are, we're all on the same page, trying to solve the same problems all in a different way, but actually driving to the same goals. The center of excellence, um, just to close off on, on sort of what we are doing in the center of excellence, we started off modestly. I think this is the beginning of a conversation of how this connections, the knowledge sharing, and looking at regulatory innovation can happen. We are, we are working towards um, listening, understanding, and, and getting to know what the needs are. And as you start seeing, as we start moving into phase two and phase three of the, of the, of the launch, we're looking to see what can we do immediately that will start helping all stakeholders, that includes patients, that includes providers, and includes researchers who are, who are going to feed um, the technology innovation that needs to happen and the evidence innovation that needs to happen in the space. And, and continuing that, that pathway, we would we envision the center of excellence to be a place where we could connect the dots. We could make sure that the knowledge that we need is available for us and we have access to it from an FDA perspective, but also share what we are seeing across the industry, across this product space, et cetera, and become that one-stop harmonized well, harmonization plays that not only that applies to us in the US, but also being in line with international regulators. I'm, I'm gonna dive into some of the things that we have done so far. We've been very active uh, at FDA in the devices world to provide this ongoing clarity. And this is just an example 
the uh, 21st Century Cures Act provided uh, a modified definition of the medical device, and we've been working towards clarifying those. It definitely has an effect on where FDA focuses on, where FDA doesn't focus on. And we put out a whole, whole bunch of guidances last September in 2019, about seven guidances at a time, which talks about how 21st century cures affect the, those policies that we had put out, that we had published you know, many years ago. And, and just to, for reference, I think there are, there are a few things that are sort of fundamental, the changes to, uh, to medical software policies resulted from 21st Century Cures Act is, which is in the center of the screen, gives you a sort of good overview of what, what effect the Cures Act had on the device definition. But then some of the foundational policies such as mobile medical apps have been now added the word software function, which basically says, the Cures basically asked us to say that the policies that you had in mobile medical apps applies to all software. And so we, we kind of clarified that as well. I want to point out a couple things that are relevant for, for digital health and the COVID-19. We put out on our website examples of how, from a public health perspective, how does FTA see these things sort of move forward? And I won't read the entire slide, but the gist of this is we completely look at it from a risk basis, risk perspective, and want to make sure that from a population health uh, sort of efforts and technology, we want to encourage those things to happen. And they are squarely, some of it are squarely outside of our policies, which just said a long time ago, and some of them happen to be within, within our policies that FDA would need to, to look at or actually has an oversight expectation on it. So I would encourage people to look at those things. But let me focus to a bigger picture. So we, I shared with you all the policy efforts that, that's been going on. And as we start thinking about regulatory innovation, we're thinking about what should a practical oversight look like? You know, this information has been, this work has been informed by the international work that we have done under IMDRF, which is International Medical Device Regulators Forum. But really what we're doing is trying to take our practical, uh, uh, the next chapter about making sure that our oversight remains practical, remains to the goals of providing patients access to this technology. Uh, and as we start moving towards that, I think the questions we're trying to answer is, in our current world, we have a whole, a, a very different ecosystem where the product development timelines are different than in the space of digital health. And we're trying to solve towards how do we if the products are going to get developed so fast in weeks and days and updated constantly, how do we sort of, how does the regulatory system ans answer that? And how can we keep up with those changes while providing our, our standard of safety and effectiveness? And then opportunities such as post-market data with the digital health products, it can imagine very much prime to collect user information, engagement inter information, in the product itself. How do you sort of lean forward? How do you collect that information? So we have our benefits and risk calculus, you know, in a, in a very proper, proper form as opposed to just the risk calculus. So having that balanced approach um, and having a practical oversight will probably also help us get to this, this concept of if many, many, many products are, are developed easily by many, many stakeholders, what would that, where would FDA and how would FDA sort of tackle those, those challenges? And we've been working on that really, really uh, intensely for the last you know, few years. And I can tell you, this is all in the sense of making sure that we are ready for the future that's gonna come at us as, a, as, an, as, a, um, as, an, as an economy, as a system, as a country. Our goals has always been to enhance patients, patient access to these technologies. We are not missing, we're not losing that out of sight. We're looking at how do we allow manufacturers to rapidly improve. Uh, one of the things we all know in software is you have to really understand uh, emerging challenges, emerging issues such as cybersecurity, so that the maintenance of the reasonable assurance of safety and, safety and effectiveness is, is there. And at the same time, we're not burdening the ecosystem, both the providers, the patients, the, the manufacturers, the researchers, as well as FDA, and wanted to make sure we want to make sure that that stays least burdensome. So we we've, we've been on this pre-certification program journey, which I call a development program, which 
is really trying to, in a, in a short, way, short sentence, moving from an episodic oversight to a continuous oversight to, uh, that enables trust in not only the product itself, but also the makers of the product, then comparing it to, to how the product actually performs in the real world. And when you bring all those pieces of information together, what level of safety and effectiveness assurance that we can get and we are looking to understand that further as we as we sort of move into this into this world and as we start keeping on building the program we've been we've been pu putting our updates free, uh, regularly and we recently published something on a pre on the status on this program and we we basically said we've learned learned quite a bit i think we need to move move towards a place where we can start emulating and are simulating the scenarios um, that we anticipate that could happen so we can we can, we can accelerate the development of this program uh, faster than we've been trying to get to in a manual way. So that's sort of the gist and the results of, of, the, of the update that we put, but really it boils down to this, this roadmap before we actually launch the program, we need to make sure the program is built, it's iterated, we're looking at very novel and innovative, innovative ways to sort of regulate and make sure that our processes are stable and scalable so we can actually try to actually test it in real life. So that's sort of the update on the program itself. And switching to the topic of AI and machine learning, I know I'm covering a bunch of topics here, but I'm leading to this, this common set of ad regulatory advances, uh, challenges that we are looking for. Um, the AI and machine learning program is based on the pre-certification program concept, which is really talking about you know, how the machines are trained what thresholds we should look for when we when the product goes out to the market for the first time, and then how does it stay maintained and how does the performance keep on improving while making sure the regulatory systems can provide the oversight on when the things start degrading, we need to make sure we have better controls on it. And, and you can see from this picture that we are really trying to, trying to understand how to implement that. And we are starting to experiment with some of those things already. Um, just to give an idea of like what we heard back from from our commenters and public, and, and some of you may have commented on this uh, on that approach. And we, we've seen a lot of support towards this innovative way of looking at it. We also have seen uh, plenty, of, uh, um, plenty of support and suggestions on how to make that even better. We're taking that all into, into consideration and we're working towards next steps on, on that entire effort of machine learning and AI. Um, before I go any further, I just wanted to share uh, start start to look at some of the things that we are looking at as challenges, and op and perhaps it should be looked upon as opportunities. We all know for a good machine learning, we need high quality, well curated data sets. We all know that you know we are used to knowing how the machine or the software actually translates what it's given as inputs and translates to something that one can use. What does that look like? What does that explainability look like? I know there's a lot of work being done in this space both from an engineering perspective, software perspective, but also from a clinical perspective. And then in the last but not the least is the bias discussion. Um, and we all know a machine, especially machine learning algorithms are, are not rule-based, are not programmed a priori. They're usually trained based on what, uh, what data it's exposed to. So we, as we start going into how we start looking at bias, it's going to be really important for us to start looking at, you know, how these, how this training algorithms or trained algorithms, when exposed to a certain sub subset, can can they actually maintain that transparency to the users? So, for example, hidden bias in an AI can be can negatively impact sort of the use, which we all know from you know lots and lots of years of uh, of science and and our clinical trials that. We want to make sure that it is representative, the output is representative of the population it's, we want to use in. But on, I can tell you the machine learning and AI is sort of is posing a different question. If we were to make it extremely personalized care, will, will, can we use bias to an, as an opportunity? Can we, but we need to be very transparent about it. So we, we know it, cannot, it should not be used in certain areas or we know how much to rely on. I think that's the debate we need to sort of understand and sort of have. We also know as we start seeing multiple products in a rapidly evolving conditions, um, 
we know we're going to learn a few lessons from the emergency use authorization, but how do we ensure that from day one, what those lessons are and how do we sort of bring that reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness? Um, there are many, many opportunities, but I'm going, to go, I'm going to end with this last slide to talk about some opportunities and challenges and hopefully raise um, some, some thoughts for you all who are attending this, um, this lecture to start thinking about what kind of measures um, at an individual level we can, we can trust. What kind, of what kind of common vocabulary we can, we can all start using in the space of digital health? How do we start looking at transparency from a user-centric label, um, labeling perspective? And a labeling has a very standardized meaning for FDA and, and for all, all the people on the phone probably uh, or on the call. But I think we are looking at you know, things like dynamic labeling. How do we think about that? What does that mean when a product changes over time? And how does the user really know what the performance is today versus yesterday? And then you, we are seeing increasingly use of consumer technology in healthcare and in clinical trials and all towards a good cause, probably the, the race of sensors being so ubiquitous and, and commodity is really bleeding into healthcare where we used to, where we used to having very pristine, you know, I used, I hear, hear the word medical grade uh, and how do we sort of, con how do we use that? And how do we trust those technologies? What are the some challenges that we could solve together? And then, and we, and we start thinking about um, how, what can be learned with this potential opportunity that AI brings to the table where humans cannot, cannot connect all the dots in between different evidences, et cetera, across the world. How can AI be a tool that will inform not only sort of the decision-making in a clinic, but also decision-making in, in the regulatory sense that we know that the right evidence exists, the right preference exists for patients and the right tolerance on risk that is acceptable for that safety and effectiveness threshold that we all have. I'm gonna pause here and, and turn it back to you, Lawrence. I, I hope we can have some uh, question and answers so I can, we can start talking about how do you start tackling some of these challenges? Thank you. Great, Bakul. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, so just kind of going through the questions, and some of these may have kind of been addressed in your slides, but I'm going to repose them anyway because um, people are asking them. Um, so the first question from Matthew is about is whether is can you discuss how FDA regulatory approval for a artificial intelligence or machine learning algorithm? may change as the algorithm evolves over time with use in practice or for research purposes? So I think there's a couple of questions in that question you just asked, Lawrence, and, and tell you our proposal for this discussion paper we put out last year in 2019 was about if you could predefine the changes that you anticipate within a indication of use, um, we would want to make sure that a priori when the FTA is reviewing it for the first time can actually be something that, that we could, the agency and, and the sponsor could agree upon. So that's like one, one path for one certain types of product. And then you ask the question about how does that matter or how will that matter if it's used for research only purposes? Um, and if I were to sort of guess if that's the right question, I would say, I think for research only purposes, you still want to have the same confidence as you'd want from a product that is being used by patients or by, by clinicians. So I think the validation and test that people are going to put in place during a clinical study to make sure that if it's an endpoint that they're relying on with machine learning or AI, um, is it still going to be valid? Because you don't want a tool that's going to be giving you a different result than you expected something else. So I think it boils down to, can you learn with the machine learning and, and mechanisms that your, that your endpoints, primary or secondary endpoints in a study, actually all of the research that you're doing is actually can be relied upon. Okay, thank you. Um, and then you asked a question about a discussion paper on change controls of continuously adapting algorithm and pre-market notification needs for certain post-market changes. I assume that's the same discussion paper that you were talking about in 2019. So yes. his question is, um, 
does FDA have a plan to turn that paper into a guidance? So we're working to the, to the next steps on that paper as we speak, actually. And you'll start to see our next steps documents sort of come out soon to talk about what actions we're going to take. And I'll just give you sort of a preview into what we're thinking. You know, one of the things that we, we want to sort of explore further is what does this good machine learning practice standard look like? And I think that's an area of huge interest for people that if you start with good practices, good engineering, good software practices, good machine learning and data science practices, that solves one piece of the puzzle. So I, you can imagine one area of work um, that we, we are, we're looking to sort of, in, sort of work towards. And so we can start recognizing what does good look like and what does not good look like from a regulatory perspective. Um, but this is, the, this is a largely a, a stakeholders sort of work that we would want to be part of so we can, we can have the right expectations and standards set. The other area of, you know, what does that look like for that, the concept of uh, change, change protocol for the changes that we, we that the sponsors anticipate. So you'll see those kind of efforts going forward and you start seeing it may result into something um, like a guidance document. In fact, um, one of the guidance document we did, uh, we did propose in our, in our guidance list for 2021 is on, uh, on AI and machine learning. Great. Um, there was a second part to that question and I don't know if this is um, that guidance document that you're talking about right now about that, that's being proposed for 2021, but um, he'd like to know, uh, is there going to be guidance on class three AI machine learning device change controls? Will that guidance cover that? Yeah, so we are not actually differentiating between types of um, classes or risk of the product. I think the risk of the product is a different calculus. The technology powered powering those risks is a very different question. So if you think about, you know, if it's made with plastics versus metal, but it's doing the same thing, I think technology, the plastic versus the metal may raise different questions for safety and effectiveness. And I think that's a product by product sort of way to think about it. The machine learning and AI sort of work that we're working on is really trying to be um, sort of agnostic of the risk, but then the individual risk of the type of the product, if it's class three or class two, might might be able to adjust based on sort of what um, what the risk of the product itself is. Okay, the next question um, uh, from Laura is related to that. So her question is, uh, could it be helpful if the review and approval of digital AI is done in categories of risk? There might be very solid AI, but there could be good AI that is useful, but individuals need to understand it might be something to use with evidence development. Yeah, um, maybe I'll, uh, I'll repeat back the question and you tell me if I got this right. Um, I think you're, you're asking about, will, will, the, will the AI that is used for evidence development, is that the question or is it, is it something else? Um, let's see. Looks like so, Laura's on, but she's muted. Yeah, let me, so I said it so people can unmute okay. themselves. Okay, I'm so unmuted. Are, yeah. Good morning, thank for your nice presentation. I think my question is more in what you discussed as an answer to the question from Matthew Rowe, which was about the, uh, that things may change as the algorithm evolves. And this mm -hmm. is something similar, right? So there might be, an AI that may have like an 80, 90% uh, solid evidence, but there, there, there is, a, and that might st still already be useful as part of diagnostics, which is my background, of course, um, to use, but it's not yet finished. And, and the real world evidence may actually help to make that happen. And so that could be, which is done in reimbursement as well sort of use with evidence development. That's so, so my thinking was, could there be like categories in approval that sort of indicate that here you have an AI, which is like solid, everything well, this is something ready for use, but not yet prime time um, completely. Yeah, I think you're, you're asking the question about, you know, the, with an AI and machine learning, the opportunity to learn and improve performance is real. 
Um, and as we start thinking about diagnostics, for example, you will see better sensitivity, better specificity as the, as the machine learns better over time. Um, that's exactly the point in the paper that we put out is like, we want to see performance increase, but we don't want, want to see performance degrade. And, and the way to do that is if you, if a maker of the, of the algorithm, it can predict if they're gonna add more inputs to the algorithm or they're, gonna, they're going to just perform more validation over time because it now has more experience um, and the performance increased because they have really sure the performance has increased and not a temporary thing. I think that change control uh, is what we're looking for in sponsors. And in the regulatory part, we're looking for, will a manufacturer of such algorithm or maker of such algorithm can be um, on top of making sure it stays on the increasing side of the performance as opposed to the decrease and avoiding any decreasing side. So that's, that's what we said in our, in, our, in our paper, which requires you know, um, the makers of such algorithm to be and not just thinking about today, but also what is the algorithm going to learn down the road and how they're going to make sure it's only in the right direction. Okay, that's very, that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, another question that was sent is how does FDA view the dis device company ownership of the patient data? Huh, interesting. Um, let me, I think we changed topics. So let's just talk about that for a second. You're right. I think uh, we put out a guidance about, I would say three, three years ago about patients, um, patients own their data. I think it's, it's from FDA's perspective, I don't think we have a, um, we have mandate, but at, from our perspective, we want patients to own their data. Now, there's going to be some proprietary information that the companies may have that they may want to protect. But when it comes down to patients understanding and, uh, and understanding their own data, uh, we would encourage all device makers to share that openly with the patients. All right. Um, if anyone else has, so those were all the questions that came in through chat. If anyone else has questions, you can also feel free to unmute yourself. Um, and pose them directly to the pool by clicking the mute button next to your name. Um, I have a question, so let me ask this question first. Um, so obviously, you know, AI and machine learning are are um, is also used in kind of drug development, right? Or there, there's high interest in using it in drug development. And so, how does your new digital health center of excellence interact with the other medical product review centers like Cber and Cedar? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Great question. I, I think that's exactly the point for the Center of Excellence is to start making those connections between other parts of the agency, um, other parts of the center within CDRH as well. There's a lot of work happening in other, other areas um, uh, of, um, of the center. And then uh, other parts of the agency like CEDAR and that is for drugs evaluation, uh, biologics evaluation, as well as other parts like CIFSAN, that is food, I think there's lots of work being done. And the hope is and the coordination part of those activities that drives to common interest is something that we're looking to sort of set up and establish. So as we sort of move forward and establish the center of excellence, as we start building that, that structure, uh, one of the key points in that uh, and for the center of excellence is to establish that communications, um, understanding needs, understanding when working on common things of interest is something that we are going to set up as we move forward. So I guess to clarify, so the, the Center of Excellence currently is housed within the Center for Devices, um, but there is not currently a plan for an agency-wide kind of Center of Excellence for digital. So this, um, yeah, no, great question. I think even though it's housed within the Center, uh, Center for Devices, this Center of Excellence is actually applicable to all FDA. So it is truly a virtual Center of Excellence on the topic of digital health. Got it. All right. Thank you for that. Um, are there any other questions? From Hi. Yes. This is um, Jane Ware. Um, thanks for the opportunity and thanks for the presentation. 
So I, I wanted to follow on to that question about um, the uh, Center of Excellence living in CDRH. What is your understanding or feeling about the um, the capabilities or the the staff um, who are in the other centers? Uh, are, is the agency staffed with with the appropriate um, or with the tech technology backgrounds and and knowledge that they need, or is that something that the agency is working on trying to bring in? So it's a great question. I think the reason why we started off and this work is primarily housed um, or stemmed from the Center for Devices is exactly that. So Center for Devices is a very technology-oriented center in, in FDA. And within that center, we had started on, in my group to build the, the concepts of digital health technologies and the expertise we need to provide for the rest of the so CDRH. And this is the natural evolution that we're going through is by making sure that we are not still, we're, you know, many people are looking for this kind of, kind of expertise. And what we are offering uh, here in the Center of Excellence is within FDA, if there's a core group of expertise that can lie within that's co-located, that can serve other parts of the agency is really what we're looking for. So the short answer is, yes, we have the expertise. Yes, we would like to build some more and start building it so we can serve and start being connected and staying current and, and synergy, synergistic in terms of the needs as well as sort of the support and expertise we can provide to the rest of the agency. That's what we are hoping for. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we've had another question come in um, from Helen. Can you elaborate more on the strategic partnerships that the center is looking to form or has formed? Is this primarily within the FDA or with industry, academia, et cetera? Is the plan to have one per focus area? Yeah, <clears throat> so we would never claim to be the, um, the collector of all work that's happening across the world in digital health. I think our goal is to be very much aligned within FDA. So our regulatory expectations are, uh, are posed as a common thing to the rest of the rest of the world, including researchers, including providers, including patients. Now, <clears throat> one of the key parts of the center of excellence is providing services to people uh, who are not at FDA, like providers and researchers. And we, we are looking at ways through mechanisms such as CERCI, such as public-private partnerships, to be that coordinating function, or at least be part of the coordinating function that will advance and empower the work in digital health. All right. Um, are there any other questions for the pool? I had one. Um, this is Tom Switzer. Just more of a practical question. If we're looking to seek feedback from the agency on an AI ML tool for an endpoint for a clinical trial for a drug effect, who do we go to? To you or to like the review division? Because actually we're planning on doing that and seeking some input on that. And I see overlapping even in like improving on the training and such. Absolutely. Um, it's a great question. And I think a really practical one, like you said, my recommendation would be the Center, for, uh, Center of Excellence at the, for Digital Health is not is not looking to review and provide regulatory decisions, but we are here to provide advice and support to the review divisions in different parts of parts of the agency. So for in your particular example, if you're looking for endpoint endpoint in, you know, just, just make it diabetes, for example, or some cardiology or some other field, you would you would engage with the review divisions and you could, and one way to sort of engage us is to request our request the center of excellence and engagement into that conversation. And we would bring in that expertise on AI ML to the table. And it might very well be that the people at the, at the review divisions may already have that exp exposure, but you're welcome to ask for, for an engagement from, our, uh, from, from the center of excellence group. Right, thank you. Well, let's see you, Tao. Thanks for addressing my written questions. Um, apologize for the ugly uh, green screen, it's supposed to be uh, my virtual background. <laughs> Somehow it didn't turn out. Uh, uh, so I, I asked about, I, I remember when I read the uh, 2019 
uh, FDA discussion paper on AI machine learning changes. It was heavily focused on cost to um, 510k type of devices. Um, and I just wonder for cost three, whether we can apply the same type of thinking um, as long as we can have control on the performance and risks and we somehow, you know, uh, uh, for PME devices, we can uh, annually report some of the minor uh, updates. And the reason I asked this, um, I had multiple discussion with the review branch offices. At least until a year ago, they were very reluctant to do anything similar for, for PME device, uh, even for very minor software changes, uh, not, not related to uh, AI machine learning and you know, autom automatic uh, algorithm update for anticipated minor changes for smartphone app, for example. I just wonder whether uh, there's a willingness, a willingness now to apply the same thing in, in the discussion paper for minor class three uh, algorithm updates. Yeah, uh, thank you for that actually clarification, but I, I can tell you with class three devices, um, there is a different bar, as you know, about changes and you know, small changes could have a major effect and major changes may have a very minor effect, right? And the whole idea behind class three PMA products is to be sure that we are not leaving uncertainty to harm patients. And I think that's really sort of the bottom line of what people in the agency like are concerned about. Um, however, I think we are open to looking at exploring methods such as the work we've done in the AIML for, AI, for machine for class three products as well. Um, and I think it's it's important to sort of practically sort of work through the risks and see if those change control protocol, for example, in a machine learning algorithm does address those risks that people are concerned about. And if we, if we can do that in a reasonable way, I don't think you as a maker of a product and we as FDA mean to harm patients or, or reach some unintended consequences, right? So I think working towards that common understanding and making sure that you know how do we how do we start thinking about you know will those seemingly you know reasonable small changes um, do really cause risk and and from a regulatory perspective is that sufficient for an annual report or is it sufficient for a you know, 180 day review. Okay, um, one more question came in from Monica. Um, can you elaborate on your current efforts around digital technology? So there's, there's plenty of work going on uh, in the world of digital pathology. And you can imagine this sort of also squarely lies within the group and in OHT7, which is really, really good at looking at imaging and the work around imaging. And the lessons learned in the work on imaging is are being transferred over and being worked and discussed on how to can that's exact same uh, concepts that we have learned a lot through you know medical imaging can be applied to digital pathology um, in the space. Um, the work that's been going I mean we have an MDIC collaborative sort of work that's going on with on digital pathology as well, and I'm not fully versed in to describe exactly what's going on there, but. Others on the call from FDA can probably probably answer that better than I can. But I can tell you there's that the work on understanding sort of the risks, understanding sort of what standards um, and, and, and help being part of the creation of the standards is something that we're looking for to establish so we can be in the space exactly like we are at, um, at medical imaging and how we look and view medical imaging. So there's lots of cross-learning happening there. Great. Does anyone from FDA want to add anything? Take that as a no. Okay. Um, are there any other questions for the pool before we end this lecture? Yes, here's one, okay. Um, all right, so the question is, 
how do FDA's plans to accept new types of data for approval, for example, cloud versus gateway, or I, I guess the question is how, I guess what is what are FDA's plans to accept new types of data for approval, like cloud versus gateway? Um, and the comment is, as you know, there is a limitation with the current gateway system. Uh, you, huh. So I'm pretty sure this was a reference to e submissions um, and how how this is um, how is how the submissions are going to be reviewed by FDA. Is that can the person clarify that? This is based on so this is regarding the submit how 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 the company will be submitting the data to the agency because right now we're using the, the gateway systems and, yeah, and I think obviously there is a limitation uh, with that. Yes, definitely. I think I mean in in parallel to the work that we're doing on the policy and regulatory side of digital health, there's an entire separate effort, effort on digital transformation on uh, that sort of is going to take our IT infrastructure to the next level, and you can see. There's a lot of work being done in that space, and I'm not fully involved in all those activities, but I agree with you. I think right now our, our you know, default is to use the, D, uh, the gateway. Uh, eventually, I think you know, uh, we will probably be in a different spot, but I think as we start learning what kind of information and data would be accepted, could, should be accepted, and the mechanisms would have to be created. So I don't think we are there yet. All right, um, here is another question um, from Helen. Is the center's work in real world evidence applied to the use of real world evidence in all centers? So including for use in evaluating drug approvals or is it just for medical devices? So there is an, um, there's, there's an effort on real world evidence happening at, at, in the Center for Drugs, I believe, I believe also. And I know for a fact that we have a real world evidence work that's happening at the medical device world. So I don't think it's a one stop shop for everything uh, from a real world evidence perspective. And I think there's going to be more, uh, more co collaboration that would be sort of happening. And I believe it's already happening, but maybe not from a, from a stakeholder perspective that you can, you can find an answer here and sort of take the same answer somewhere else for real world evidence. And I think that's, that's something that's a, that would be a natural evolution down the road. Great, all right. So if there are no further questions, um, let's thank Bakul for his excellent talk today and we'll conclude the lecture. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me.